All right. Hi, Science 14 students. We're going to go over this uh, material that's going to prepare us for our next test, which is going to be on December the 7th. And uh, if you watch this recording very carefully and practice the questions on it, this will play a big part in doing well in the test. So let's get started. So first of all, uh, can you guys imagine what it must have been like to look under a microscope and see living things moving for the very first time? It must have been totally amazing to do this. And the first guy who ever did this, his name was Anthony von Leeuwenhoek. He was the first person ever to see life under a microscope. Now at certain points, scientists began speculating about what the building blocks of life were. And they came to the conclusion that the cell was the smallest unit of life. So we saw there's different types of microscopes that people have made. The light microscope or compound microscope is the most common kind. We're most familiar with that type. And as the first name suggests, it uses light to help us see objects being magnified. Now as you can see in this diagram, a part called the diaphragm, which is part right here, is a part which opens and closes the microscope to let different amounts of light enter the slide the image is on. And remember, there's two lenses that are working together to help magnify an image. There's the eyepiece lens, and there's the objective lens. There's three of them here. So usually when we look at the magnifying power of a microscope, it's usually in the range of 100 times or higher. Now less powerful instruments like a magnifying glass can be used when less magnification than 100 times power is required. Okay, so we're just going to go over a few uh, review questions based on the material we just went over. So what's the smallest unit of life? Of course, that's the cell. And which microscope uses light to magnify images? That's a compound microscope. And which two lenses work together in a compound microscope to magnify an image? The eyepiece lens and, that should be the word and, objective lens. Which part of a microscope allows light to pass through the object being viewed? In other words, it controls the amount of object that's uh, entering into the slide? That's the diaphragm. And how much is the magnification power of a microscope? It's at least 100 times or more. OK, so what do we have here? We have the cross-section of an animal cell. Now, the organelles of a cell can be compared to the parts of a city. So remember, the organelles are the different parts of a cell, each carrying out different jobs. They're kind of like the organs of a body. And that's why they're called organelles. All right, so which one of them is like the border of a city, which keeps certain things in and certain things out of the cell? Well, that would be the cell membrane. Which organelle? is like the generator that changes fuel into energy, or uses up the fuel to produce energy, or is also known as the powerhouse of the cell. That's the mitochondrion, these guys right here. And uh, next question, which part of the cell is like city hall where decisions are made? That's the nucleus, which of course is usually found around the center of the cell. All right. So moving on, here we see the cross-section of a plant cell. Just a few differences. So there's, there are two organelles which are found only in plant cells, which animal cells don't have. What are they again? Those are chloroplasts and cell walls. So you guys remember what the job of a chloroplast, chloroplast sorry, is? Well, these organelles contain the pigment called chlorophyll. And it's this pigment which makes plants green and allows them to carry out photosynthesis. Now, how about a cell wall? What does it do for a plant? Again, its job is different from a cell membrane, which controls what comes in and out of a cell. Instead, a cell wall provides both protection and strength to the cell. OK, we're going to talk about nutrition and digestion. Here's a guy. He really loves his veggies, or fruit, rather, his strawberries, which I do as well. Um, OK, so again, nutrition 
is the branch of science that deals with how the body uses food. When we talk about diet, that refers to the amount and the type of food that you eat every day. Okay, so of course, you know, eating strawberries is better than eating junk food. But if you were to eat only strawberries all day, that wouldn't be good for you either. Instead, we need what's known as a balanced or mixed diet. So a mixed diet includes all of the four food groups in it, which you can see in this picture. So we've got fruits and veggies, bread and cereals, meats, fish and alternatives, and milk and dairy. Now, a vegetarian diet is healthy in many ways. However, if you only eat veggies and fruits, you'll likely become low in some essential nutrients. Do you remember what they are? Those are iron and the B vitamins. Iron we get from eating meat, primarily. Okay, now, you're probably familiar with the term fad diet. You know, you might see someone on, for instance, the Oprah show talking about the newest fad diet or something like that. These are usually some sort of new approach to dieting that becomes very popular because it promises to help people lose weight quickly. Another name for a fad diet is a diet craze. <clears throat> now, for a while, people were, uh, a lot of people were on the Atkins diet. It was very popular, and it had people eating a lot of bacon. All right, now more about the four food groups can be found in the Canada Food Guide. You've probably heard of that before, I'm sure. And when we look at the nutritional value of foods, we're talking about the daily value provided in each of the areas that are important, such as fats, carbohydrates, that sort of thing. So you've probably seen this sort of thing before. If you look in the cereal box, you'll see this sort of thing. And it tells that a certain serving of cereal, for instance, one cup, provides this much of our daily value of fats, uh, cholesterol, you know, carbohydrates, dietary fiber, that sort of thing. Now, years ago, people didn't know a whole lot about nutrition. So sometimes people got the disease known as scurvy. You can see this guy right here. He's got uh, sunken eyes, loss of teeth, pale skin. Sailors would sometimes get this. <coughs> Excuse me. They sometimes get scurvy because they didn't eat enough fruits. And, of course, fruits provide vitamin C, and so vitamin C, a lack of vitamin C was actually the cause of scurvy. Nowadays, we don't see too much scurvy, at least in um, North America. Okay, so, again, let's go over a few review questions. What's the definition for diet? The types of food we eat each day and how much of each? What's a mixed diet? It's a balanced diet with all food. All four should be food groups. What's the problem with a vegetarian diet? It's low in vitamin C and iron. And what's the cause of scurvy for sailors? Not enough vitamin C from fruits. Can you say arr, Billy? OK, there you go. So steps in digestion. Be a good thing to look at this diagram here. It's kind of a cool one. Um, pop open the little uh, sort of doors here and see what's underneath. And so we're looking at the steps in digestion. So digestion, of course, is the process of breaking food down into smaller and smaller particles. After digestion, food is removed as waste. So this diagram gives us an idea of some of the steps that are involved. So in general, digestion is broken into two processes, and those are mechanical digestion and chemical digestion. Now, mechanical digestion is breaking down food using physical methods. So mainly this is happening with our teeth when we chew our food, but it also happens with different organs such as our stomach when they churn our food. Again, they're breaking it up by phys physical means. Uh, chemical digestion is, of course, as the name suggests, where chemicals in the body are used to break down food. So when food first enters our mouth, starch in the food is broken down by special enzymes known as amylase. Amylase enzymes are part of the saliva secreted by our salivary glands. So enzymes play an important role in chemical digestion. We also see chemical digestion in the stomach where hydrochloric acid or HCL has the action on foods of chemical, 
chemically digest, digesting them. All right, so we talked earlier about uh, starch being broken down by amylase in our uh, mouths. And french fries are an example of food with a lot of starch in them. OK, so the intestines, which you can see right here, are a place where we see both mechanical and chemical digestion taking place. Now, do you remember which of the intestines, either the small or the large, is where most digestion takes place, which involves breaking down carbohydrates, fats, and proteins? That's in the small intestine. And in the large intestine, mostly what's going on is that liquids are removed. And of course, this produces feces in the end. Feces are solid waste. Uh, so the large intestine has the job of absorbing water, vitamins, and minerals. OK, so what I'd like you guys to do at this point, when I send out this video, I'll be sending out the link you can see here. So I'd like you guys to watch this YouTube video. Uh, so you can stop the recording at this point, and then you can start it again after watching this YouTube video. And after you do that, you'll be able to answer the questions that come after the video. OK, so at this point, after watching the video, you'll be able to, um, we'll, we'll be talking about what the different stages of digestion are they were mentioned in the video. So let's go over them again, though. So first of all, food enters the mouth. And then once it enters the mouth, teeth are going to grind up the food. And then at that point, the food is going to go down this tube called the esophagus. So the esophagus pushes food down to the stomach in wave-like wave spasms. And this motion is known as peristalsis. Now once the food is in the stomach, the stomach contracts and this causes the food to mix with the acids in the stomach. Then acids and liquid food are neutralized and nutrients are absorbed. Okay, so again, remember this is in the small intestine, the nutrients being absorbed. Then vitamins, mineral and water are absorbed, and again, we know that's in the large intestine. And last of all, undigested food is excreted out the rectum here. OK. Great stuff. OK. So um, be able to put those steps in order that we just looked at. Be able to do that, please. Um, and now let's go over a few more review questions. So what are the two types of digestion? Again, that's chemical digestion and mechanical digestion. Next question, 16, give examples of each type of digestion. Physical, okay, teeth grind up our food, stomach churns our food. Chemical digestion, um, again, we saw this amylase substance, which is an enzyme secreted by the salivary glands, breaks down starch. Also, we have HCL, acid in the stomach, digest proteins. OK, so now test yourself again to make sure you can put the steps in digestion in the correct order. And here they are again. Food enters the mouth. Teeth grind up food. Esophagus pushes food to the stomach with wave-like spasms. Stomach muscles contract to mix food with acids. Acids in liquid food is neutralized, and nutrients are absorbed. Again, small intestine. Vitamins, mineral, and water are absorbed. Large intestine. And lastly, undigested food is excreted. OK. So at this point, let's examine some of the different body systems and the jobs they do. So you can see here this diagram is showing us one of the circulatory system which has the job of transporting food and gases all over, kind of like a highway system. Now the circulatory system, because it's transporting food, it kind of works together with the digestive system to move nutrients to all the different areas of the body where those nutrients are needed. All right, how about the respiratory system? Of course, the lungs being the part we notice the most. The respiratory system is responsible for getting oxygen into the body, and carbon dioxide 
for waste gas out. Uh, I was just talking to my kids the other day. Uh, one of them was, you know, accidentally breathing into a, a bag. And I said, hey, you know, you just got to be a little careful about that just because um, you're breathing out this carbon dioxide stuff into the bag, which is a waste gas, and then you're breathing it in again. And, of course, you want to be breathing in oxygen instead. And I said, you know, it can get you a little bit dizzy if you do that too much. So, uh, how about the muscular system now? Okay, it makes it possible for the body to move. You can see how all these different muscles, what they're doing, the different types of movements they enable us to do. All right, skeletal system. Now, the skeletal system uh, supports and protects the body and its organs. It also works together with the muscular system to enable us to move. Of course, without the skeletal system, if we only had the muscular system, our body would be like a mass of jelly and we couldn't move anywhere at all. All right, this is kind of a freaky diagram. Now, this is the nervous system. And you can see the jobs of all the different nerves here. You know, like this nerve is responsible for accelerating the heartbeat. This one causes the contraction of the bladder. Are you thankful that all these jobs, all these uh, different nerves do their jobs? God's created our bodies in such an amazing way. So the nervous system controls involuntary responses, and you can see how it controls the different organs of the body. Now remember this, there's always a connection between a stimulus and a response that it causes. For instance, if a big truck is coming towards you, that's a stimulus. And the response run is uh, what saves you there, of course. So a stimulus and a response, again, they always go together. If something's hot, that's a stimulus. Take your hand off the stove, that's a response. Okay, and this guy's running here. And here we have the reproductive system, which, of course, allows organisms to reproduce. Okay, so let's just look at the function of uh, some of these different systems. The circulatory system, what does it do? Well, it transports food and gases. It circulates them around and around. The skeletal system, it protects organs, supports the body as well. Respiratory system, brings useful gases in and removes waste gases. The nervous system, it controls involuntary response and remember, you always have a stimulus, something like a loud noise or whatever, causes a response. You run away from the noise. You shut it off. Okay, let's look at some different diseases of the various body systems that we looked at. This little guy seems not too well. So, of course, sickness is never fun, and there are a number of different diseases we can get in various body systems. Now, one thing you might have gotten once before is heartburn, which is a burning sensation in the upper chest region caused by stomach acid. It's often caused by eating spicy foods, and it feels like it's a problem in your heart area, although the problem actually starts in the stomach area. And myself, one time I ended up going to the doctor, or going to the, uh, well, the emergency, because I felt like I had a pain in my chest, but it just turned out that it was uh, stomach acid. But again, it feels kind of like it's a heart problem. Well, sometimes, of course, people really do get heart attacks. Um, and sometimes people get the terms confused heart attack and cardiac arrest. Okay, so what's the difference between the two again? A heart attack is damage to the muscles of the heart, usually caused by a lack of blood flow. Cardiac arrest, on the other hand, is when our heart stops completely. And that's where we get the word arrest from. Now, as you know, this thing here, it's called a, I think it's a sphingomanometer or something like that. Um, it's a device used to take your blood pressure when you go to the doctor. And what he or she will do is use this device, wrap it around, and test out how high your blood pressure is. Now, usually high blood pressure is more of a concern than lower blood pressure. Um, and do you remember what 
causes high blood pressure? Well, that's foods like this, which are delicious, of course. These are foods that are high in salt and high in cholesterol. So they can lead to high blood pressure. And remember, when we're talking about cholesterol, we're talking about foods that are high in animal fats. Okay, now speaking of food, there are also people who tend to eat too little rather than too much food. And there's a condition known as anorexia nervosa, which is a type of eating disorder where people feel like they're always eating too much. And as a result, they feel guilty about eating food and end up becoming very thin as a result. So let's have a look at some different conditions that we just looked at. So what's heartburn again? Well, remember, it's actually a condition that involves the stomach. It's when the stomach produces acid that causes pain in the chest. How about a heart attack? That's damage to the muscles of the heart, whereas a cardiac arrest, as the name suggests, is when the heart stops completely. Well, high blood pressure is caused by eating salty foods and those high in cholesterol. In other words, high in animal fats. Anorexia nervosa is again an eating disorder where people are always concerned they're eating too much. Okay, let's look at uh, diabetes and insulin. Um, diabetes, especially years ago, was a very, very problematic disease. Um, it's a disease that relates to how much glucose, in other words sugar, our cells are getting and therefore how much energy we, we have. Now, one of the ways that diabetes is diagnosed in people is if they have large amounts of glucose in their urine. So it's referred to as sweet urine. Um, you'll probably be interested to know that diabetes or was actually, um, the control for diabetes was um, basically uh, Banting and Bess were two guys in Ontario who came up with, uh, well, they discovered insulin. Insulin is a hormone. We're going to talk a little bit um, later about, you know, what it does. But the interesting thing is Banting and Best got the Nobel Prize for discovering insulin, but it was actually a guy from Alberta. Not everybody knows this. A guy named Alfred Kulip, who first was able to purify this insulin. Now, unfortunately, I think he might have um, not written down the instructions completely or something like that. And so initially, he didn't win the Nobel Prize, but fortunately, Banting and Bass were nice about things, and they chose to share the Nobel Prize with him. Okay, so again, let's uh, talk a little bit about the connection between diabetes and insulin. So how does diabetes relate to insulin? Well, first of all, insulin is a hormone produced in the pancreas. The job of insulin is to unlock our cells to let sugar into the cells. I'm going to underline that. Insulin's job is to unlock our cells to let glucose or sugar into the cells so the cells can use it for, sh for energy. Now, without insulin, our, sh our cells lack sugar, so we're tired. And this is why people with diabetes end up with extra sugar in their blood, which then ends up in their urine, because it's not used in the cell, therefore they have an excess of it in the cells, in, in the bloodstream, rather, I should say. Okay. So I have a question here to kind of tie everything together with insulin, diabetes, and glucose. So it says, explain how those three terms are related. So here's one possible explanation. Diabetes is a disease caused by a lack of insulin. Insulin lets glucose or sugar into the cells, and without it, we lack energy. Also, the excess glucose left in the blood eventually ends up in the urine. Okay, another problem we can get is uh, from ulcers, and ulcers are breaks in the lining of the stomach and the small intestine. Okay, so let's look at some different procedures or operations that we can have done on our hearts. Um, we saw earlier that problems can develop in body organs, and sometimes operations need to be done on our hearts to keep them working properly. Now, when people first come into a hospital complaining of heart problems, 
Usually a series of tests are done to examine the condition of the heart and the circulatory system. A test known as an angiogram examines the condition of the blood vessels. Now, sometimes a device known as a pacemaker is inserted near the heart. Its job is to send electrical impulses to the heart and maintain a steady heartbeat. So, of course, you want that thing working really well. Another type of device you want working really well is an artificial heart. Looks like this. It's a very advanced medical procedure or medical um, device, I should say. And just like a regular heart, its job is to pump blood throughout the body. Okay. Now, our bodies need to maintain a sense of balance, right? Because things are always changing in the environment. So we need to adapt to those changes in the environment. For example, if we experience a change in temperature, the first thing our bodies need to do if we have a change in temperature is shift the amount of blood flow to or from that area of the body in order to make that area either cooler or warmer. Now, there are some other steps our bodies will take as well to warm up or cool down. For instance, we might sweat or shiver, or we might speed up our heart rate. Um, but those steps take longer to produce a or temperature change as compared to shifting the blood flow to a certain area. Okay, so let's uh, explain the role of each of those different tests and procedures we looked at. Okay, the pacemaker, again, that's a device that keeps your heart beating steadily. Artificial heart, like our own heart, it pumps blood throughout the body. And an angiogram, that's a test that tests the conditions of our blood vessels. All right, so congrats, guys. You've finished the end of this recording session. And uh, I just want to encourage you again to keep going over the blue questions to make sure you can get them all. Um, again, go over the lessons that you know are going to be on this test. If you have any questions, give me a shout. Keep working hard. I hope your test goes awesome. God bless, and have a great day. Bye for now.